opening traps. Whether you love them or hate them, you need to know them. As Grandmaster uh, Andrew Saltis once stated, the very minimum is to know the opening traps that could arise in your own, own openings. My name is Mateusz Kołosowski, I'm an international master from Poland and in this video I'm going to show you a couple of interesting uh, ideas, opening ideas or opening traps uh, that could arise in four nights uh, opening and um, I hope you're going to enjoy it. Let's not waste any time and jump right into it. So the basic position is of course going to arise after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3 uh, and one of the opening lines that I wanted to show you is bishop c5. Of course the main move is bishop uh, is not bishop c5 is knight f6 and then we actually have our four knights game uh, but before we reach that position uh, and consider variations that uh, are um, are going to be uh, are going to arise from this position let's quickly take a look at bishop c5 because this is a good starting point for a very good reason this is considered to be a bit inaccurate even though it looks like black just develops the bishop to a central position uh, practically preventing the d4 move because after uh, the regular knight f6 uh, you have to expect white to play d4 uh, and of course uh, hundreds of thousands of games were played from that position at practically any level from uh, club games to world championship matches uh, so why is bishop c5 such a bad idea and this is the first move we need to consider and this is not really a trap this is an opening mistake i should say uh, but whenever you play or attempt to go for four knights opening with white and someone plays bishop c5 against you you need to be well prepared against that that's my opinion and that's i think uh, you could hear oftentimes from more experienced players basically black cannot do this black cannot play bishop c5 for a very nice reason white captures the pawn on e5 uh, and what is the point of this of this move it's uh, not really a peace sacrifice but this is a tactical idea uh, a short one which is aimed at gaining control over the center um, although there is going to be some uh, a nice poisonous line we're going to look at in a second so first um, we need to consider knight takes e5 this is of course the most critical continuation after this white just goes d4 forking the bishop and the knight this is quite straightforward i think further explanation is not required uh, so basically we sacrificed a knight for a pawn and now we are going to regain regain one minor piece and this is the point thanks to this idea we're going to uh, we get rid of the pawn on e5 black had the pawn on e5 just a second ago he doesn't have it anymore and we are going to have a nice central control uh, black could of course take on d4 but then we recapture with the queen we have a pawn, pawn in the center a nicely centralized knight on c3 uh, and a centralized queen on d4 so we can already say that this is advantages to white uh, in particular if black does something reckless um such as d6 after f4 it might turn out turn out that uh, if the knight needs to go away um from e5 we will be able able to capture the pawn on g7 and then you can only imagine how problematic the black's position is going to be of course this is far from being forced black can still save himself for instance by means of playing c5 but then uh, it already feels that um, black is under tremendous pressure for instance after bishop b5 check uh, the knight is hit the king is also under check uh, the pawn d6 is going to be permanently weak in fact it's very easy to lose it and here i would actually uh, i can easily believe this is completely lost for black for instance knight c6 knight d5 this is just uh, enormous pressure 
And having said that, um, there is another reckless move that could be played, and this is uh, in fact a game, a fragment of a game uh, played between Reti and Dunkel Dunkel Bloom, uh, a very old game, but uh, an instructive one. So Black played Queen F6, and this is something a white player really needs to know. It's not really protecting the knight on e5. It's not the the queen queen f6 move was not only aimed at doing that. There is a, a venomous tactical idea, which uh, well, if you miss it in the game, you might you will really regret it. So what Black wants to do is to take advantage of the fact that there is a there is an X-ray on the queen on d4, and the queen is actually not protected at this very moment. So in case Black manages to play uh, knight f3 check, the queen is going to capture on d4 in a moment. So for instance, if white went for the straightforward and uh, nice looking knight d5, that really backfires very quickly after knight f3. You might imagine g takes f3, queen takes d4, black wins the queen and likely the game. So this is the tricky part in this line and really worth remembering. Um, but also there is a nice refutation to this uh, trick that black just created on the board. What white can do instead of knight d5, there is a nice multi-purpose move knight b5. So the point and the main difference here is that we not only we attack the pawn on c7, but also, um, or more importantly, we actually control or protect the queen on d4. So the knight um, plays two major roles, one attacking and the other defensive one. In the very next move, white could be interested in, of course, playing f4 just to hit the knight on e5, but uh, most likely knight takes e7 is just a legitimate threat right now. So the game between those two players saw king d8, and right now, uh, surprisingly, or not, because if you see a king on d8 as early as on move um, 7, sorry, I had to consult the notation, um, as early as move 7, then you might feel something is wrong with the uh, with this particular play player's position. So here, Richard Retty came up with simple and effective queen c5. Um, of course, according to the opening principles, you're not supposed to play two moves in a row with the same piece, or um, to rephrase that, you're uh, not supposed to make a couple of moves uh, in the opening prior to developing the rest of your pieces, of your minor pieces in particular. But of course, in chess, uh, I'm sure you already know it, for uh, every rule, there is at least a couple of exceptions. And of course, you can sometimes break a rule in order to win the game instantly. So here, queen takes c7 and queen f8. In fact, queen f8 is the major of the threats because that results in checkmate. Um, well, these two threats are just crashing. And as far as I can tell, um, this is where the game notation ends. I'm not sure if the black player resigned or uh, it is just pointless to to present the remaining part of this game. In, in any event, black's position is lost. If you don't believe me, feel free to analyze it on your own. Um, but in the meantime, let's just take a look at some other options for black in this position. So instead of taking the knight on e5, as soon as black realizes that d4 is going to be white's next move, black could try to react with a counterpiece sacrifice. For instance, bishop takes f2. And uh, here obviously white needs to take, so an argument for playing this move, for playing, for going for this continuation from black's perspective could be that um, since white is not going to castle anymore because he made the move of the king, uh, this should automatically mean that the white king is going to be exposed and therefore um, it's going to be easy to attack it in the center and uh, black should uh, be able to 
take over the initiative and uh, maybe even attack the king. This is far from being true, because after king takes f2, finally black needs to recapture the knight. Please note that moves like queen h4 are met with g3, queen f6, instead, let me maybe use another color, are going to be met with knight f3. And uh, at the end of the day, black doesn't even regain the piece, which of course should lead to an easy win for white. So instead knight takes e5 is compulsory and here white can calmly react with d4. Thanks to his fantastic pawn center this position simply has to be better for white. Despite the slightly vulnerable king on f2 if you actually start analyzing its um, its position you should come to a, to a conclusion that uh, this is not as bad as it seemed as it seems to be. Because, for example, if black starts an immediate action, queen h4, white just goes g3, and the king might be able to hide itself on g2 or even on g1 if necessary. Um, so moves like knight g4, we can actually put it on the board, uh, seem to be quite harmless after king g2, queen h5. Keep in mind that this knight is also being under attack, so it needs to be protected. And now I can easily imagine uh, white just claiming the initiative with some forceful moves like bishop e2. Uh, well, in fact, you win material with this because in the very next move you're going to play h3. So, for example, d6, h3. Um, not only is the white king absolutely safe, but also black just drops a piece. And I don't believe there is a coming back for black from this situation. So this is not really a problem for white. Uh, in case black plays queen f6, white needs to go, go king g1 and this might seem to be a bit um, less desirable for white because as you see the king on g1 blocks the rook on h1. Obviously uh, the rook would be preferred on f1 but you cannot have everything in the game. You need to give something to get something instead. Um, fortunately, white has a tremendous pawn formation, of course, in the center. Um, so, as long as he manages to keep it, uh, everything should be just fine. White should be generally uh, able to bring the rest of resources, develop both bishops in a couple of moves, and then slowly consolidate his position, castle artificially, and uh, everything should be okay. Um, so one more point to show you in this particular line, in this particular video, uh, is that um, here black can still set a trap. So for example, if he goes knight e7, it's important not to take on e5. If you do that, in such situations, you are actually allowed to cry from white's perspective. This is a horrific mistake, quite an easy one to miss and definitely please do remember that because we don't want you to lose games in such a manner. Um, so before capturing such a poisonous knight it's uh, advisable to double check if you can actually do this. Uh, of course, after a move like bishop e3, white maintains the advantage. It's impossible not to have it with such a pawn center. Uh, the knight will have to go back, for example, to g6. Now you're free to play a move like e5, then possibly bishop c4, bishop d3, any other move. Mm, bring the rook maybe from uh, a1 to f1 in the future once the queen is moved. Um, I think black is not going to enjoy his position at all. Another version of this trap uh, could be could arise if black just went knight g6 immediately. Again, e5 potentially could work, but this is this is getting quite complicated because after knight takes e5, again you should not take d2 queen b6, uh, but possibly you can instead go queen e1 or queen e2, pinning the knight and only then capturing. Um, it on e5 with either the pawn or maybe even the queen. Uh, still, whenever you see those tactical ideas, make sure you double check every single tactical possibility. 
uh, just not to fall for any traps. Also, oftentimes knight d5 is just um, the safer of the attacking options and still uh, might present your opponent with some trouble. Uh, okay, so let me show you one more um, version of this same idea for you to make it uh, even more uh, clear and, and understandable. This time we're going to take a look at the same tactical motif, but from a different angle, from a different perspective. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, knight f6. So this time, as promised before, we have our uh, four knights variation um, and white goes g3. This is quite, an, quite a regular line. You could find games of um, very strong players played in this variation. In particular, as far as I remember, uh, Shahriar Mamedyarov used to play it on a regular basis some time ago. Uh, and one way to react from in this position for black is to play bishop c5. The alternative, uh, more centralized approach, d5 is also totally playable. Um, I'm not sure if there is one to be preferred. Feel free to analyze both and pick the one that is more convenient to you. Um, so black just goes bishop c5, centralizing the pieces, controlling the center, preparing to castle in the very next move. Logical and uh, absolutely playable. So it's good to be aware of certain tactical ideas in the openings, but the worst thing that can happen is when you actually mix two or don't understand where, uh, what conditions need to be met for an idea to work. So in this particular game, uh, all of the examples I'm presenting are taken from actual games. So it's not something I came up with. It, these are not artificial parts of my analysis. This was played between two Finnish players. Uh, for me, forgive me for any mispronunciations, but as far as I can tell, this is Kilpela versus Lehti. Um, played in 2002 in Helsinki. So uh, what happened in the game is uh, that why didn't realize that after knight takes e5 uh, the whole sacrifice just doesn't work at all. Because after knight takes e5, d4, one of the conditions for it to work, for the whole idea, for the whole concept to be playable is that white controls the f3 square. At this very moment, it seems that white does control it, so why shouldn't it work? Well, the major point here is that after bishop takes d4, queen takes d4 is impossible due to knight f3, and we have a nasty fork. It's not really how you probably want to end up a game, um, According to my notation, this is where the game was finished. Although I can imagine that the play that the players kept on playing a bit still without a piece at this level, which is approximately 2100, it's difficult to get back to the game, even in blitz. Uh, so just to for those of you who maybe are not following, Queen d4, Knight f3. White needs to move the the king, but then he loses the queen. Of course, it's possible to uh, play any other move in this position, but then you are down a piece. So what was supposed to be played from White's perspective in this situation? Well, of course, Bishop G2. Logical uh, move aimed at simply finishing development, castles in the very next move, D3, and then there are certain ideas. You could go Knight A4, you could go, there are plans with Bishop E3, with Bishop G5, uh, King h1 followed with uh, followed by uh, some f4 ideas once the knight moves away from f3. Um, this is just the opening phase of the game, so of course great many things could happen, but what I wanted to show you was this knight takes e5 idea and when it works, when it doesn't work, and what you should be aware of. In any case, I hope it's going to be instructive for you. Make sure you keep in mind those tactical ideas, both from white's and black's perspective, depending which side you play. Um, 
and good luck utilizing this idea or defending against it. Thanks for watching.